Well, it was a, a hobby interest to begin with. There was nothing official about it. Um, it would be fair to say at the time I was uh, not very impressed with the work I was supposed to be doing. But in general, the project office will pick up new ideas and then say, well, we could do an aeroplane something like this. The item behind this is the sixth and last of the 1127 prototypes, which were the uh, forerunner of the Harrow. And in the middle of 1957, I was in the project office, uh, really looking for something uh, to do after the expected cancellation of the 1121. And we had had a brochure from the Bristol Engine Company with some suggestions that they had made uh, as to the possibility of doing a vectored thrust engine. That is a engine which can direct its thrust either backwards or any direction, including in theory, fully forwards. Um, the original proposal was limited in its uh, usefulness, but we established very good relations with uh, Gordon Lewis, who was the uh, engineer at Bristol working on it. You start off with um, a suggestion that perhaps something like this could be done. Um, you will then do quite a lot of work on it to see if you can knock it down in, on in a theoretical basis. Um, if not, and if the thing is to go ahead, then it has to move into the design office. And again, they're divided into subsections. You have one section doing a fuselage, one section doing wings, and so on. Um, the section that was put onto the 1127, in fact, was the one I'd worked with in the time that I was in the experimental drawing office. And um, so that worked rather well. I knew them all, and they all knew me. And uh, so you get on with it, then, assuming that something like that is going to be it. And along the way, of course, you, uh, you meet snags, maybe things you hadn't anticipated, or merely that things you had anticipated turn out to be more difficult than you expect. So people will have ideas for creating solutions. All straightforward, really. Bill Bedford was the chief test pilot, <coughs> and Hugh Merriweather was his number two. And they did all the early flying on the uh, 1127s. Uh, in particular, Hugh followed on immediately behind Bill, so that if we were unlucky enough to lose number one, we still had number two up to date, to be blunt. Uh, Hugh was uh, more engineering minded, I think, studious, more studiously minded. And he did a lot of the report writing on the aeroplane. Bill, on the other hand, was the sort of chap who took an aeroplane by the scruff of its neck and it did what he told it, you know. There's one story from the early flying uh, on XP831, which is now in the Science Museum in London. And uh, that was a demonstration to whom I'm not certain down at Dunsfold of the early flying of the 1127. Bill was flying it, lined up with the runway, hovering, with the wind some 30 degrees off to one side. And uh, from the ground, I was certainly surprised to see the aeroplane suddenly do a pirouette and face downwind. And uh, I immediately realised that this was likely to have been uh, intake momentum drag, which, if you're not heading straight into the wind or straight downwind, will tend to try and turn your tail to the wind. So uh, I said to Lickley, um, I said to him, I believe that's the effect of momentum drag, that's right. And he gave me a withering look and then turned and said very loudly so the visitor could hear, that shows the pilot's complete confidence in the aeroplane. <coughs> when Bill came down and landed afterwards, he took me to one side and said, I really don't know what happened there. <laughs> anyway, it was an aspect that we had not properly anticipated. Uh, and that little uh, vein on top of the nose proved to be the answer so the pilot could keep an eye on how far out of wind he was. <laughs>